Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our evening worship. Give greetings from your brothers and sisters at the Deerfield Presbyterian Church where I was this morning. Um, they are interviewing a man, I believe, a uh, very serious prospect, prospect for their pastor. They've been without a pastor for four years, so that's a happy thought. Pray for them. Um, let's begin our um, worship by uh, standing for the call to worship. <clears throat> Some verses from the 24th Psalm. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Amen. Well, let's turn to our first hymn, um, which is uh, found um, in number 68. Hymn 68. Lord our God, you are the king, and we rejoice in it. We would have no other. We thank you for your grace that you poured upon us, and especially as we gather now this evening. Bless our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please be seated, and um, we're going to hear from oh, the psalm of the month. We'll sing it in a moment, but uh, three verses, or four verses. Um, this is um, Psalm 37, and we're going to look at verses uh, 3 to 7 from this portion of God's Word. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. 
and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way over the man who carries out evil devices. Amen. Well, let's um, uh, sing um, that. So if you'll just turn, you can remain seated, but turn to 671, forever trusting in the Lord. any matters for um, for prayer um, this evening? I'd like a little list here and we'll pray for them. Um, one thing I might mention because I don't know that the foxes will feel free to do it but we pray for their son Mark, Emma's son Mark who's um, with, some of you may remember we prayed he got into a terrible car tr crash and um, it, it was in the hospital what for at least a month, two months? Yeah, 60 days. So he is uh, now with them, which is not a, a permanent arrangement, but just pray that um, something could be a found for him to, a, a place for him to stay and for some rehab. So that's uh, Mark Nelson. Other things? Any good news from... Uh, from um, uh, um, Bruce, Bruce Land? Um, nothing's changed much. The doctor didn't find anything significant. Mm. So we recommended that he get an injection so we can get turned to rotation. Oh, right. And possibly acupuncture. Yes. We're trying everything to keep him from surgery. Yeah. They don't want to give him a fusion. They don't want to tell him his age. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's just wisdom for, you know, everybody's given us suggestions of which direction to go. And it's not very definitive, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, pray for Bruce and for wisdom and um, for treatment to what might be helpful to him. So, other things? Yes, Tracy. We're supposed to get rain tonight. Glory. <laughs> Amen. It doesn't have to come down really hard, just, <laughs> just for a real long time. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Anything else? Yes, Chris. Tim should certainly be on our list. He's um, home and um, has an appointment coming up, uh, uh, and I think Wednesday, to try to determine if what treatments might be best to uh, to assist him. So we'll pray for Tim Nimsley. 
other things. Can we pray for that piano of yours? I could go lay hands on it. Might not be pretty. Okay, well, um, if there's nothing else, let's, uh, let's go to prayer. Lord, our God, you who hear the prayers of your people, who hears and, and never misses a one, um, Lord, we come undeserving of your grace, undeserving that you should hear us or give attention to us, except for all of that wonderful work of Christ by which you look upon us with great favor and great pleasure. And Lord, you, you call us to pray, and so we do. Um, we, we do pray for a Tim, for healing and wisdom as they, um, doctors meet on Wednesday with him to, uh, to determine what might be done for his liver, Lord. You, you made all things. Um, we um, uh, pray for uh, Carol as she has a um, hip replacement coming in the new year. Thank you for that. Pray for Tracy Morris with a liver transplant need there. Um, Lord, we, we do pray for Bob Gramp, who is uh, suffering a great deal, and your mercies upon him are much needed. And we pray for, uh, our, uh, for Pastor Dan Halley, who is um, uh, living in a rental house, very expensive rental house, um, trying to determine whether his home can be repaired or needs to be just replaced. We pray your mercies upon him, Rich's Uncle Culver, and... Um, Expectant mothers and upcoming thank offering, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, we do pray for um, Mark Nelson, that you would provide for him, that you would use this in his life to help him in many ways. But we pray that you would provide a place for him and necessary rehab. Lord, we um, do pray for wisdom again for, um, for Bruce and um, Sandy, as they seek to know what could be done to give him some relief. And Lord, we, we do pray for the rain. We, we thank you for the promise of it, and maybe even a little more during the week. Lord, we are in great need of it. We read of fires and all around us and everywhere. Uh, Lord, uh, the, the fields are dry. Uh, provide, Lord. We pray for uh, your, uh, our missionaries. We ask your... Um, mercies uh, upon uh, um, those that are particularly in foreign lands where, um, where they are not necessarily welcomed but are uh, serving you in whatever manner they can. But we do pray too for those who are persecuted for the sake of the gospel, our brothers and sisters in Christ who, Lord, may you remind them that we are praying, show them we're praying and, and provide for them uh, in every way, Lord, give them hope, give them grace, and give them a continued bold witness even. Lord, we pray for the week before us. We ask your blessing upon our nation and uh, a new regime who goes in, Lord. We pray for your hand upon all affairs as, as it is, and we uh, pray for peace and prosperity, and Lord, we ask your mercies upon this country. Lord, be with our families and with each of us this coming week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, I think we have another prayer, which is 462. Why don't we stand to sing 462?
Please be seated. Our text um, this evening is found in Acts chapter 21. Well, we're actually in chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, but I'd like to, um, to read um, a fairly lengthy portion uh, to uh, catch us up and uh, help us as we look at some verses in chapter 22. So I'm beginning at uh, chapter 21 and verse 27 and reading through um, uh, chapter um, 22, verse 23. So um, uh, let these words sink into your heart as we hear this word. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort of, that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. They inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as far as he could not, and, and he could not learn the, the facts because of the uproar. He ordered them uh, to be brought, uh, him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people were fo followed, shouting out, away with him. As Paul was <coughs> about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt, led the 4,000 men of the Syrians out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I, I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them, in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, <coughs> I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at, uh, at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed to Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone upon me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, 
rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one and an Ananias, Ananias, a devout man, uh, according to the law, uh, spoke uh, uh, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, standing by me, and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be witnesses for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste. And get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was shed, I was standing by, approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he <clears throat> Uh, said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this point, excuse me, I think I've read my text. I want to read just a little longer. Up to this point, they listened to him. Uh, then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live and as they were shouting and throwing their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. Well, here we have the Apostle Paul speaking to the church and, uh, and, and to the world. Um, uh, first to the church and then to the world. We, we saw some weeks uh, previous, in the previous chapter, chapter 21, that when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, that is he, Paul greeted them, that is, uh, James and all of the elders in Jerusalem and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. That was Paul's first witness to the church. He was speaking to the people of God, uh, to James and the other apostles, to people who needed uh, to know this wonderful work that Jesus was doing all around the world. Now, here at New Hope, we receive missionary cards and in the bulletin each month, and we hear reports from time to time, as for example, a few weeks ago when Reverend Mike spoke to us in our fellowship time on Sunday mornings after the Lord's Day, we, we uh, hopefully share with one another what Jesus is doing in our lives and in the lives of others. And of course, in our prayer time, uh, we pray for our missionaries, and we pray for one another, and we pray for the church all around the world. Uh, it's a concern that we have to uh, to concern ourselves and, and, to, uh, and to pray uh, for the church. Um, certainly we do that, but that does not discharge or complete our responsibility as witnesses. We need to uh, speak also to the world uh, uh, which the church, in which the church is positioned uh, about Jesus as well. Isn't that what the apostle does in these verses? Having spoken to the church in chapter 21, he now bears witness to the world, and in this case to the unbelieving Jews of Jerusalem. In these verses, Paul has two opportunities to bear witness to Jesus. First to the angry mob outside um, uh, outside the soldiers' barracks, and, and then a second time in, verse, in chapter 23, as we'll find uh, to the gathered Sanhedrin. And Paul is not uh, shy to speak about Jesus and his hope of the resurrection. I'd like to focus simply on verses uh, 14 and 15 uh, this evening. Uh, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a word or words from his mouth, 
for you will be witnesses for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Um, those are uh, the verses that uh, of Ananias speaking to Paul, and, and really they are the centerpiece of the entire text. Um, from them we learn, first, that we're chosen to be witnesses. Chosen to be his witnesses. The apostle Paul is standing in front of this sea of angry faces. Uh, they regard him, as they say it, as the man who teaches everyone, everywhere among the people, meaning against the Jews, and against the law, meaning the Jewish law, and in this place, meaning Paul's teaching against the Jewish temple. Uh, none of which was true. But these were his uh, charges. And Paul responds to them and says, look, Look, do you know who I am? I am Saul, the man who was once the chief scourge of the followers of Jesus. And then he reviews a, a few facts for them. Uh, not only his own pedigree, uh, particularly the fact that he himself is a Jew and a former Pharisee and a student of the renowned conservative Rabbi Gamaliel there in Jerusalem. In fact, he had put them all to shame with his zeal and his hatred of the way which was an early name for the church. So how did this come about? How did this, uh, a man such as Saul, the spoiler of the church, become a, such a devoted follower and witness uh, to Christ and his gospel? Well, the first thing he's anxious for them to understand is this was none of his own doing, but rather he was appointed or chosen by God. Ananias, the man sent by, uh, uh, by Jesus to, to speak with Paul there in Damascus, while he's waiting, sitting blind in that city after his encounter with Jesus on the road, Ananias says to Paul, the God of our fathers has appointed, or better, has chosen you. And it's clear from his description that these are not um, his own words, but the words of God speaking through Ananias, who the apostle identifies as a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there, meaning all the Jews living in Damascus. Uh, this is the one who was speaking to them. Uh, it was not Ananias' uh, idea or words to uh, Saul. Uh, it certainly was not Saul's idea to be standing there conflicting with his own countrymen in Jerusalem. Um, and he says, them, look, <laughs> I was in the middle of the business of persecution. I was busy uh, representing the high priest, trying my hardest to exterminate this Jesus cult when God met with me. And I mean the God of our fathers met with me. He means the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was he who chose me to bear witness to you about Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I'm not some sort of a, a, a self-appointed wacko who, who took it into his mind to go off crusading against his own religion. God chose me to do this, to be a witness of what I've seen and heard. You need to hear me. Well, God still appoints and still chooses his followers for his own purposes. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And again, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, if you'd like to live with Jesus in heaven, if you'd like to know his favor in this life, if you'd like to have God the Holy Spirit in your heart and serve God, like the apostle, you must ask Jesus to, to save you, um, for there's no other thing to be done. And if you are saved, if you confess Christ as your Savior, then you're called to be his witnesses, God's witnesses, witnesses to Christ. That's every Christian's calling. Now, not in the same manner as Paul or anyone else, but in your own manner. And if you've ever felt a little funny or reluctant talking about Jesus, if, if you uh, ever faced a bland disinterest and even hostility, if you find yourself in a position where you guess people are saying to them, who are you talking to me about this Jesus? You can always say to yourself and to them, if you have the, the nerve, uh, well, look, it wasn't my idea 
God chose me. He saved me. He appointed me uh, to tell you about Jesus. Maybe he's chosen you too. I certainly hope so. I pray so. I'm a chosen ambassador. I have a divine commission. I remember standing in a, in a, a, a line in an airport, and a man turned around to me and introduced himself. He said, I'm an ambassador. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's an ambassador. You know, he was well-dressed. But he went on to explain he was an ambassador for Jesus. <laughs> but he was just a, a guy who would, was looking for a chance to maybe tell me some good news. Um, well, you know, that's, that's, um, that's what Paul says. Remember, the gospel is, is not your great idea. It's his. And if someone doesn't like it, although a lot of people, by the grace of God, find that they do like it, but if someone you meet doesn't like it, well, just remember, their problem isn't with you. <laughs> it's with the Trinitarian God. Uh, they may try to make it personal, but really it's not. It's between not you and them. Don't shoot the messenger. They can take it up with God if, if they want to curse and snap and get red in the face. May not help you, but it's good to remember that once in a while. Well, that's the first thing then we take away from this uh, this experience and text uh, uh, that uh, that we are, even as the apostle, chosen as witnesses. Why he chose us, we have no idea. It's certainly undeserved love, isn't it? My second point is that we're chosen to bear a revelational or truthful witness. Ananias says to Paul, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice, that is to, to say words, from his mouth, for you will be witnesses for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. God does not require his servants to be witnesses of hearsay, of things that uh, they've simply been told, unsubstantiated stories. We're essentially in the same place as the apostle. Uh, you may question, you may say to yourself, well, Paul was in a unique position to bear witness to Christ. He, he probably got knocked off his horse, or he did get knocked off his horse, or what mount he was riding on, and that's true. I don't believe there's any human here who's been knocked off their feet, at least literally, by a divine flash of blinding light, but but we, we can know his will, and we can hear his words, and we can see his work of grace in the world, in the church, and in the lives around us. We have written accounts of saints written down through the ages, books upon books, recordings, testimonies by millions of, of uh, 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 people in hundreds of tongues and languages from every place and, and every people, uh, places that we've never even heard of. And they all bear witness to the same thing to being gloriously met by Jesus in his word, through his spirit. All of this is the revelation or the revealing of Jesus to us. Especially it comes to us through the same power of the Holy Spirit that attended Paul's revelation uh, uh, here of, of Jesus here in our text. Or to say it another way, we have the truth in our hands and in our ears, and we can bear witness to truth just as Paul did. And what is truth? Well, it's not what you might think or what some people think. Professor De Dennis Johnson once said it this way, quote, the primary aim of the apostles' preaching was not to contribute to people's emotional health, not to train them how to cope with stress, talk to them, um, talk to them, uh, uh, talk to them out of despair or cultivate family relationships. The apostles' message was good news, eliciting great joy uh, in those who believed it. But their goal was not to make their hearers feel better. It was to tell the truth about God and his plan. Uh, you might say something to someone that, that wasn't particularly uh, friendly to them as they would think of it, but was the truth and good for them to hear. A message about humility and our sin and Christ and his victory and about the opportunity for faith and the certainty of judgment. But also you and I, in bearing witness to Christ, so simply are to tell the truth. It's not to be adorned or dressed up in any way. We don't hire people to spin it. We don't have someone to spin. I don't think we do. Maybe, maybe there are people that, um, that do this. <laughs> but we, uh, 
we, we don't watch their television shows. Um, no, we, we don't need that um, to make it more uh, attractive. It stands by itself. That's not to say that, that uh, we should be surly or offhanded in the manner in which we live our lives as Christians or the manner in which we speak of Jesus. But we don't have to be defensive or apologetic or too clever about it either. We should simply, humbly and simply, speak the truth in love. Jesus saves. And the gospel of Christ is the truth, and the truth saves. And that makes it very powerful and penetrating, even to those who are seeking with all their wit to avoid and suppress the truth. Sometimes things get through. Well, remember the words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. Paul said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. Those are good words. Now, one last thing about this revelation, this gospel that we've been given before moving on to my final point, and it's this that it is only fair to remind ourselves and know that truth, the truth to which we are witnesses, is not infrequently a truth that divides. When Paul brings the <clears throat> news of the success of the gospel to the ears of James and the gathered church, we read they rejoice. They rejoice. But when the inflamed mob of Israel hears about it, they do not rejoice at all. Rather, they shout and curse and throw dust in the air and want to rid the earth of him and the gospel message he bears. On the other hand, when the Apostle Paul preached that same gospel in Jerusalem to another crowd on another day, the day of Pentecost, well, that was Peter, um, we're told that um, uh, that crowd uh, telling them, therefore, uh, let all Israel be assured uh, of this. Uh, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And we read in that case that when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? When the godly Stephen uh, bore witness to Christ not long afterward, also in Jerusalem, we're told the crowd became furious and gnashing their teeth at him and covering their ears and yelling at the top of their voices so they wouldn't have to hear his testimony. They dragged him uh, out of the city and they stoned him to death. And yet James and the elders of Jerusalem bear witness to Paul in our last chapter, 21, how, how many thousands of Jews in Jerusalem had been saved. So the truth divides, doesn't it? Some will rejoice to hear the mighty stories of God's grace about the person and work of Jesus and how a man may be saved apart from his own works. And they'll understand it and embrace it and embrace Jesus Others will get angry and argue and be annoyed or completely disinterested. The apostle describes it this way. As, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ. Listen to this. We are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one, we are the smell of death. To the other the fragrance of life. Some will be thrilled to hear the truth um, and others will be offended. One university professor I read about recently went so far as to say that, um, that the biblical account of the uh, condemnation and death of Christ itself is irredeemably hateful because it casts so many of the Jews in Jerusalem in a bad light, not to mention the Romans. So it should be disallowed. It's a hate crime to tell that central story of Christianity, period, by which this genius just scrapped 2,000 years of Western history, not to, me, not to mention the saving faith of millions, but a hate crime. Well, we need to reject that sort of thinking. The gospel is not a hateful message. It's not hateful to speak a loving truth and a message of hope, even if people respond hatefully to it. But we shouldn't be surprised to hear that sort of talk. Uh, the apostle uh, Paul knew perfectly well what would happen when he used the word Gentile to that crowd or when he used the word resurrection later 
when he appeared before the Sanhedrin. Those were hateful, or at least controversial words that drove them to murderous thoughts and actions, but they were not hateful words. Well, the question is, of course, what will you do with the truth? How will you respond to the gospel? Will you believe it, share it? Will you be a chosen witness to the truth? So, we are chosen as witnesses, that's the first thing. We bear uh, witness to the truth, to divine revelation, a divine message, that's the second. And finally, uh, that ours is to be a Christian witness, a specifically a Christ witness. And, and take good notice, when Paul stands up uh, to give his testimony, the focus is on Jesus and not Paul. He doesn't tell stories about how wonderful he is. What little he says about himself is simply a prelude to, to talk about Jesus, and it's not a message of religious methods or laws or, or lifestyle. Uh, we want to show people Jesus and his saving work by which alone our broken relationship with God may be mended. We're not able to mend it or save it ourselves. Um, that is so hard to understand. All the religious and moral efforts of the world, every wonderful scientific discovery and medical breakthrough, everything we can muster, our best efforts will never put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We just can't do it. No one can. In fact, deep in our proud, selfish hearts, we don't even really want to do it because we're okay. But by the supernatural grace of God, by the saving work of Christ applied to our heart, by the power of God, by that message, we may be regenerated and our souls made alive and born again by the grace of God, but only through Jesus Christ. Our aim, and I'm quoting again from Dr. Johnson, is not to enable people to function better at work or at home while they persist in their hatred toward God. Rather, it's to bring us home to the Father who will remake us in his son's image by the Spirit's power so that we reflect his love and holiness in all our relationships. What I'm trying to say is simply that if we believe that we have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, which is the great focus of the Bible, then we need to keep our witness and testimony pretty sharply focused on Christ alone and on his saving message. And refuse to be uh, sort of uh, taken off the track, so to speak, by someone's pet theological discussions or issues. Um, I remember uh, 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 somebody telling me one time, he was ministering to, um, to college students. And uh, he, uh, he was talking with this one uh, co-ed and... Uh, and um, he kept saying to her, but why won't you follow Christ? If I answered all your questions, do you follow Christ? What is it that's keeping you? What is it that's keeping you from hearing this word? And, and finally she just said, I, I got to go. I've got a class and she ran off. And later her roommate told this man, she didn't have a class. She was just getting uncomfortable because um, she didn't have an answer to your question. She was living with her boyfriend and was feeling guilty about it. Well, that's the sort of thing we're saying. Um, deep in our hearts, often, uh, we don't want to follow Christ. But we need to resist the temptation to talk about a lot of other things. Uh, we need to, uh, and this girl wanted to argue about all sorts of theological issues. Um, but uh, when we talk with Christians, with unbelievers rather, and when we share with them the gospel, um, we need to focus on Jesus. The church's stand on evolution or sexual immorality or Bible versions or baptisms or raptures or predestination or the use of the Lord's Day, um, there's a place for those discussions. They're not unimportant at all, but it's not our primary part of our witness. Our witness is first to be in Jesus, and we need to stay on, um, on, on message when we do speak with others. Uh, and Jesus in his gospel, brothers and sisters, will never get old or worn out or exhausted. No preacher who faithfully preaches from the scriptures will ever exhaust all what can be said about Jesus in Christ. 
are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Uh, the word of God does not take us beyond Christ. Rather, it takes us more deeply into Christ so that our thoughts and our attitudes and our values and our desires and our reactions and words and behavior may be transformed by Christ. The hymn says, more about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Paul's marching orders uh, um, are for us as well. You will be his witnesses to all men of what you have seen and heard. If you've seen God's saving grace at work in your life, if you've known anything of the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God and his unsearchable judgments and his paths that are beyond tracing out, and especially if you've heard the words of life which you have, the gospel which you've been saved, then, then you have a testimony to be shared. And won't you seek to bear witness to Jesus? How can you be a testimony in some way? Ask God simply to give you an opportunity to bear some witness this week. Several weeks ago, I was, um, I'm going to say, required to go to a, an event um, that I wasn't particularly excited to go to. Go to. It was a, something that was going on for hours, and, and I, I was not looking forward to it. I would, would have rather stayed home. But, but I, I did have to do it, and, and I did think to just pray briefly, Lord, you know, make this useful. <laughs> you know, look, I, I want to use my time well, you know, use this well. And, um, you know, sure enough, uh, this, this is one friend of somebody's came in, and, and uh, I was able to, uh, just very naturally, we got into conversation, was able to share the gospel very, very simply and fully. I, I'm not a bold witness. But it was so obvious. It was so evident. It was right in front of me. And no one could have missed it. No matter, not one of you would have failed to say something to this uh, inquiring man. So ask the Lord uh, to give you an opportunity to be a witness to him. Just ask him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the apostle and for this text which shows us of how he was compelled uh, to speak to people who did not want to hear him. And yet at other times he spoke and was gladly received. Lord, we thank you that uh, we're called to, to bear witness. And Lord, all of us are, don't, uh, are not evangelists. None of us are evangelists. But we pray that you would give us words to speak, uh, a, a scripture to share, uh, a testimony of God's grace this week to someone whom you will appoint for us to speak to. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you will <coughs> turn to our final hymn, number 406, we're going to sing that, and then I'm going to give the benediction, and then we're going to stand to sing the benedictory hymn, which you all know. So 406, let's stand to to, um, to, to sing that first.
And now may the peace of our Lord give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all.